Chapter 23, To Help Indians. I've been at Chilagi Indian Industrial School two whole months now. The noble mission of this fine institution is to help the Indian. I've now heard the superintendent say that more times than I can count. It is meant to, tend, it is meant to teach the Indian a new modern way to finally make him into a useful citizen after, as Superintendent Morrill puts it, untold generations of meaningless savage life, to give him a true higher purpose. After the time I've spent here, though, it seems to me like the true purpose of this place is to wear the Indian out. I've done enough marching to have walked to California and back. The daily routine here starts at 5 a.m. with the first bugle. ta 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 da da ta 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 da da ta 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 da da ta ta Reveille, assembly, close order drill, even before morning mess. That's true for the girls as well as the boys. They also have to march, but in their own companies. Then the day's work begins. Students handle all the maintenance work at the school. We grow all the food, work in the fields, clean the stables, feed the farm animals, fix everything that needs fixing. We boys are all kept busy growing and building things that the school can sell. If we are lucky and are chosen to, chosen to do certain jobs, just as Possum told me, like cutting the grass on the lawns, we can actually earn as much as 35 cents a day. The girls do all the cooking and kitchen work as well as the sewing, making and mending things. Some of the boys who have sisters or cousins in the girls' houses have told me about what those girls have to do every day. They may not be plowing fields and picking rocks, but they do the cleaning and dusting and scrubbing of the floors as well so they do not have it easy. My first two weeks here, even though I thought my hands were used to hard work, I ended up with big blisters on my palms. I had cloth bandages wrapped around both hands, but it didn't prevent me from having to keep on working. Bleeding hands or not, if you don't do exactly as you are told, you get demerits. If you stray off a walkway and step on the green grass, you get demerits. If you're late to class, you get demerits. If you, take, if you make too many missteps in close order drill or your uniform is not neat, you get demerits. It's not just the staff who can give you demerits. It is also the older students who've been chosen to be monitors. So someone is always watching you during the day, including that man on top of the water tower. Get enough marks on your red card and you get punished. Loss of privileges is one punishment being told you can't take part in social activities or go to town once a month. There are worse punishments too, that even though they no longer use the whipping post, which is still standing by the parade ground. It's a log half buried in the ground with iron rings on it five feet up where a boy's hands could be fastened. Being sent to break rocks down where the creek runs closest to the school grounds is still common practice. Making big rocks into little rocks, just like you were on a chain gang. Scrubbing floors on your hands and knees is another punishment you get for too many demerits. My behavior since I've been, he been here has been so good that I hardly have any demerits at all. Even though the one thing that was on my mind all the time for the first week here was the one that would have earned the harshest punishment, running away. <clears throat> Not only do you lose all your privileges, as soon as they drag you back, they shut you up in a dark room for a day or more with just bread and water and a bucket for a latrine. Among my friends, that has happened to most of them at one time or another. I sure as blazes do not want that happening to me. By the time the last bugle comes at 9 p.m. after evening assembly, some boys are so tired they can barely drag themselves up the stairs to fall into bed without even bothering to wash up or take off their clothes. They're too tired to do the one thing that so many of us dreaming dream about doing, running away and never coming back again. Thinking of running, I continue to be a disappointment to Sergeant Chapman, our drill captain. He has now asked me three times to come to track practice. Make some use of that God-given speed of yours, Bird, he keeps saying. We could use you in the hundred in the last leg of the relay. He's explained to me, more than once, the benefits of being on a sports team. Not only would I get time off from the various duties around the school, I'd be able to get away on trips to compete against other schools. Where's your school spirit, he's asked me. I've just listened and said nothing each time he's tried to convince me. I don't want to get involved in this place any more than I am. It's enough that I have a bunch of friends in our creek gang. I don't need more than that. I don't intend to stay here a day longer than I absolutely have to. As soon as Pop gets back from Washington with his bonus money, I'm going to be out of here for good. School spirit is something I don't care about or ever intend to have. 
Although I no longer think about it all the time, the only running that appeals to me would be running away from here to wherever I can find my pop, which I will not do because of my promise to him to stick it out till he either sends for me or shows up to get me. I have to admit, though, that there, there would be benefits to being one of the athletic boys. They have a special training t table in the mess hall with more food than the other students. The ones who get treated best are the boys on the boxing team. That's because Superintendent Morrill has a special love for that sport. That is why he has a special boxing class twice a week during our physical education time, where we usually just do such things as sit-ups, jumping jack jacks, and exercises using Indian clubs and medicine balls. Once a month, the school has boxing matches, where our boys either fight each other or boxing squads from other Indian schools. School boxing coach is Mr. Handler, the brown-skinned Cherokee man who graduated from Chilagi in 1912. <clears throat> According to C.B., our dorm advisor, when old man Handler was a student at the school, he was the light heavyweight boxing champion and never lost a match. He might even have become a pro fighter, except that being a poor Indian, he would not have been given a chance to win any real fights. He got an offer from a promoter in Oklahoma City. C.B. told a group of us one night before bed, went down there to see what it was about, but the deal was that he would have to look good for a round or two, and then take a dive to whatever white boy he got matched against. Story is, story is that he said, like this, stepped in and knocked their promoter out with an uppercut. Then he came back here and has been here ever since. Since then, the only boxing he's done has been as a coach in between his main job of running the harness and shoe repair shop. He's as good a coach as he is a harness maker, which is saying something. Though he does sometimes go on a bit about this sport about how this sport came to be in England with its Marquis of Queensbury rules. England. That's where Pop and his regiment of 3,800 men went first before being sent to France. I remember Pop describing how it looked as they got close to the English shore. And I'm on that boat. I can see the white chalk cliffs of Dover ahead of us as our troop ships near, as our troop ships near the land. I can smell the salt spray, hear the harsh voices of seagulls as they circle around us. Bird! I open my eyes. Mr. Handler is staring at me and holding out a pair of boxing gloves. Your turn, he says. Against who, I'm thinking, as I slip on the gloves. Then, I see who's stepping into the circle that is serving as our boxing ring. It's bear meat. A big grin on his face. Oh, my. Go get him, Jay, Possum yells. Bear meat, the leader of our gang, outweighs me by a good 50 pounds. From the grin on his face, this is going to be all in fun for him, at least, but I do not think he is going to pull his punches. The other 40 boys gathered around us are echoing what Possum said in various ways, except none of them are cheering me on. Go to it, Bear! KO in the first, Chief Bear! Mr. Handler ignores them all. Remember today's lesson? Mr. Handler whispers to me, right hand on my gloves, left on Bear Meats. Then he raises both gloves. Touch gloves! Bearmeat thrusts his gloves against mine so hard that it makes me take a step back. If that had been a jab to my chin, it would have knocked me into next Tuesday. Mr. Handler clicks the stopwatch he uses to time the two-minute round we'll be boxing, unless I get knocked silly a whole lot earlier. Fight! Bearmeat steps in with a lazy looping roundhouse right. I duck under it and dance back, gloves up in front of my face. Come on, Jaybird, Bearmeat growls, still grinning. He steps forward with a left jab that knocks my right glove back into my nose. It stings, but doesn't keep me from hopping to one side and avoiding the right cross jab that set up to and avoiding the right cross that jab set up. This time I circle to my right. Finesse it, Jaybird, Possum hollers, using the word I taught him today out of my Webster's. That he pronounced it finesse doesn't take away from the pleasure of knowing I've got at least one person rooting for me. The sudden thudding of bear meat's left against my right shoulder diminishes any pleasure I'd been feeling. I stagger to the left where my ribs thud are greeted by bear meat's right hook. That hurt, but despite having half the wind knocked out of me, I do not go down. Bear meat knows he's got me, though. He's no longer trying that hard. He's just pushing me around. He grabs me in a clinch. I try to remember what to do. I dip my right shoulder, pivot up from my hips, and throw the punch we learned today, a right uppercut. It lands square on Bearmeat's jaw, but all he does is just about break my own knuckles. Bearmeat steps back half a step and throws another punch of his own, 
hard left hook. Whoop! It lands square on my chin and knocks me flat on my backside. I'm only there for a moment. I'm up on one knee, trying to keep going when I hear Mr. Handler yell, Time! I'm pretty sure it is well short of two minutes. I'm glad he's taken pity on me. I was not going to quit, but if bear meat hit me again with one of those pile driver punches, it would have scrambled my brains. Possum and Little Coon are helping me up. Bear meat is walking around with his hands raised. He's got the right to do that. No question who whooped who. Then he comes over to touch my gloves. There's a grin on his face and he's saying something. Maybe okay. Mr. Handler's pulling off my gloves. The ringing in my ears is letting up enough that I can make out his words. I'm not going to ask you to join my boxing team, son. We've got enough punching bags, but I give you credit for hanging in there. You got sand, son. 